And so for you to manifest, you have to build up, build up in prayer. Because there is a place you pray to where there are coals of fire. That's where your tongue will be touched. And if your tongue is taught, it will be poured. When you come back, you can become a prophet. Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. God bless you. Please be seated. You know, we are approaching the last days. And so men need to build spiritual stamina. We need to build capacity in the spirit because of what is coming. This is no time for lukewarm Christianity. This is no time for selfish and self-centered Christianity. If you are still serving God for gain now, it means you have not discerned the season. The war and the battle of the age is beginning to climax in the spirit. And when princes begin to war in the spirit, the effect is felt on earth. Earth, unfortunately, is the theater where the battle of princes is manifested. That's why when there was war in heaven, between Lucifer and his angels and Michael and his angels, the impact was not in heaven. The water that was uttering commentary in the day of that battle is a woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. Because every time there is war in the heavenlies, the impact is on earth. And so if you are on earth, you need capacity. Because if you don't have capacity, you will become a casualty of the battle of princes in the spirit. And the battle of princes is beginning to climax in the last days. That's why Christianity at this time cannot be the babyhood Christianity. The time has come where even widows we not just seek help. Widows will become prophetess. The Bible said, widows receive their dead back to life. In the day where princes fought, even widows need strength. Weak men must be made valiant in strength because the time to push the armies of the alien backward has come so that we will reduce casualties. If we remain babes like the days of Rachel, we will weep because our children will be no more. But God forbid that in the day of battle you are a child. God forbid. I will be sharing with us briefly on the subject of the great awakening. That is upon the body of Christ. In Joel chapter 2 from verse 1. He said blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm. Upon his holy mountains. He said let all the inhabitations of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. And it is nigh unto thee. The reason he says to blow the trumpet is because. There are some who are woed in Zion. And those who are woed in Zion are those who are at ease. They say, woe unto him who is at ease in Zion. So when the moves and the movement of the spirit begins, it's always important that trumpet has come to create an awakening in the spirit. So that those who are at ease in Zion will buckle up and give up their loins. For the move of the spirit. If that doesn't happen. The negative consequence of the last day. Will be for many. And the negative consequence of the last day. Is called the great falling away. Because iniquity will abound. He said the love of many. 
will wax old. And when men become lukewarm, even God can't use them. He said, because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. So in the last days, you can't be lukewarm and you can't be cold. Because there is such a thing called the great falling away. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 1. Second Thessalonians 2 from verse 1 to 3. Paul the apostle by reason of insight into the eternal agenda of God began to explain and to expound to us the things that will before men in the last days. Because he knows that many will take those seasons for granted. Even as they did in the days of Noah. That up until the day the flood came, people were dancing, drinking and marrying. Some were marrying and being given in marriage. There is nothing wrong with dancing and singing. Something becomes wrong when you dance and sing and you are not discerning of the season. So Paul began to let us know that things will not be normal in the last days. And so in 2 Thessalonians 2 from verse 1, he said, now we beseech you, we beg you, we indulge you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord and by the gathering together unto him. He was talking about the rapture. He was talking about the realities that will happen when the age is about to come to an end. He said, on the strength of the rapture and the gathering together of ourselves, on the strength of the urgency of the season. You know, there were many things Paul saw that were unlawful to be altered among men. So when a man like Paul begins to seek your indulgence, pay attention. That's why he said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We are not just persuading men because it's necessary for them to be saved. I have gone to Hades. I know the pain and the terror, the affliction and the torment that befalls those who are in Hades. You see, I know a man many years ago, whether he was in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. But I know that that man was caught up even to the third heavens. So he went to the realm where the government of God dwells. And that was not only his sojourn. He said, I was caught up even unto paradise. He went to Hades, to regions where the things that happened there, men shouldn't hear it. You know, when the rich fool was caught up in Hades and he was seeking just a drop of water to quench his thirst, they told him, a drop of water in this realm is a luxury. You can't afford it. Because to, have, to access water in eternity, you will pay with your soul. Because the only spiritual tender for purchase when time is accomplished is the soul. So if your soul does not work with God enough to have a state with Him, you can't buy as much as a drop of water. Because there they don't take dollars. They transact on the economy of your soul. The impact and the power that your soul has in that world. Your purchasing power is the strength of your soul. And that's why Jesus spoke. He said, what shall it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul. Because in the world to come, Everything will be procured by soul power. And so the man could not have a drop of water. And they began to quickly intercede for his brothers. They said, please, send Lazarus back to the world. I know that I'm doomed. But I have brothers that are living riotously in the world. Like the way I lived when I was in the world. Please, go and warn them. He didn't say go and advise them. I have seen yonder. And I know that when you journey yonder and you don't have a place with God, you are doomed. So even though during the man's lifetime, they didn't talk about his relationship with his brother. Maybe they were keeping malice. But there's a place you go to that you don't wish it even for your enemies. What the man saw, even though he didn't have an earthly relationship with his brothers, he said, please go and warn them so that they don't come to where I am. 
But you see, in the last day, it won't be one person. It won't be two persons. There will be a great falling away. A multitude, a huge number will be swept off because of the things that will come. And so Paul began to besiege the church. He said, I beseech you, brethren, on the strength of our coming together unto the Lord. Go ahead with the scripture. Except for in the last days, he said that ye be not soon shaken. Because what is coming, even apostles and prophets, their conviction will shake. He said, because of what is coming, that you don't be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letters as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. And then he went to verse 3 and told us what will happen. He said, let no man deceive you by any means. He said, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin is revealed. So a time will come, the direction where the body of Christ is going to, that people will come and say, if God can't give me my school fees, I will look for my school fees by other means. Because the gospel they are hearing is the gospel of survival. A time will come where men will say, if God can't give me a husband, I will look for a husband from another location. And men will turn away from God, thinking that the mercy of God will be around forever. Thinking that there will be forgiveness. It is the deception of the age. That a point will come where men will casually turn away from God, not knowing the peril that is attached to it. So Paul was advising us that deception and trouble can make men shake or change their mind. He said, but he's besieging you. There is a strength and a stamina that you need to have in the spirit so that deception can shake you. Trouble can shake you. Hope you know, during the last attack, some people never returned to Mubi. It didn't matter whether God sent them here. The weight of what they saw. <laughs> they realized, is he not preaching? We can preach in Lagos. The problem is that in the lexicon of divinity, they were not sent to Lagos. So the trouble that came to Mubi shook their conviction. And when they left, like Lot, they began to see greener pasture. I pray that God show mercy. Because if God was the one who sent them to Mubi, what they have done is that because of the riot, they have walked out of their destiny. And every other thing they are doing will not be in the radar of their destiny. When they check, they will not be numbered. But these kinds of things will happen again and again in the last day. Many will turn from God. Because in the last day, the Bible said in 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, that men will be lovers of themselves and not lovers of God. Now, even in church, that's already happening. Even spiritual things like preaching, people are not preaching because of their pelvis. Because men are what? Lovers of themselves. More than they are lovers of God. It's a sign that we are in the last days. Perilous times will come. But when they come, will you be able to stand? The idea and the concept of the great awakening is not just to stir your conviction, but is to give you stamina so that whatever comes your way, you will be like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. Let me show you another scripture. Matthew 29. Matthew 24 from verse 9. See what Jesus said. <laughs> the last days are terrible times. That's why the greatest power of God will be manifested in the last day. Because a time will come when you will not need to live on blood. You will not understand. They are manufacturing sicknesses now in the lab. Sickness now is not just a natural phenomenon. It's not only demons that are incubating sicknesses now. Now they go to lab and they prepare virus. 
a virus and they launch it over a territory so that people will die. And then the virus can travel through 13 nations in 24 hours. Before demons have to labor to make men sick. Now demons are resting because the wickedness in the heart of man have climaxed that men will come and say the population of the world is too much. Let's reduce it by one third. And then they will go to the lab without demons and incubate virus. Some of the virus are airborne. They will come to a city and release it. And everybody that work in that city within that period will contact the virus. And everywhere they go to and breathe, others will contact the virus. So a time will come when you will have to stop living by blood. So if something contacts your blood, it can affect you. You will have to live by another life that is superior to the blood life. So we will not be organizing healing services. Men, we have to walk in divine health. Because the wickedness of the world, before you make it to the healing service, you may die. So you can't afford to wait for the healing service. You must know how to stir the life on your inside. So that when those kinds of evil and demonic diseases come, you will go to your room. Mako barakaka. De de de. Jacobre kakatulia. Elola zinzavaka. You, you stir the eternal life that is on your inside. And you choke that virus. Because inside you will be an antivirus that comes out of eternal life. Because if you are waiting for a healing evangelist to come, it may take one month. And the virus will kill in six hours. So you need to know what to do in between one and six hours to stay eternal life to kill that virus. A day will come when you will not be permitted to buy food. The Bible says money failed in Egypt. You will have your money, but there will be no food to buy. You need to know how to come to your home and sit with your five children and tell them that one cup of beans that is remaining, bring it here. And you will eat by priesthood. And you will bring the beans and Father, we thank you for these beans. In the name of Jesus, beans don't finish. And beans will begin to multiply. <laughs> because if beans doesn't multiply, if your life have one billion, there will be no food to buy. Unless your soul is bargained. You may need to bow to a system or to a demonic God before you can afford food. So you will be caught in between whether to die of hunger or to die with your conviction. But if you don't want to die with your conviction, then you must know his spiritual technology. Whatever it was that Jesus knew that made him lift five loaves and two fish and multiplied it, it must become a common phenomenon in our generation because we are in the last day. A day will come when you can't travel. You have the best of jeeps, but you can't travel. Because when you travel, it's either your allegiance has been compromised or you will die. So we have to go back in prayer. You know, when Jesus was praying on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said there came to him Moses and Elias. We have to go back in prayer and meet Philip and tell him, what did you do that you were carried by the wind? So you not only need apostles of your generation, when you go to your room to pray, you must find portals in the spirit to journey back and ask the patriarchs that caught those dimensions. What was it that you did that made the Holy Ghost carry you by the wind? These things may look alien, but where we are going to, if you cannot walk in it, you will die. That's why there must be a great awakening. So that God will not have Enoch, Paul, Philip, Elijah. God will have generations and tribes. So there will be a tribe of Philip that know how to travel by the wind. So when you want to travel, you don't go to the airport. You find the men that are of the Philip order. And then you come to them and tell them, I need to go to Lagos. And he will tell you, come by 1 p.m. And when you come by 1 p.m., he will take you to Lagos and back. And the world will not know what is happening. Because it will not be superstars. It will be an army. And this army will have different kinds of weapons. Some will travel by the wind. Some will multiply bread. Some will not die. They will know the secrets of immortality. 
So when men are sick, because the hospital will not attend to you, you need to find the men that know the code of immortality. If that awakening doesn't happen, a day will come when no prophet can visit your borders. So you need to raise men from among yourself. And because God knows that those days are coming, there must be an awakening. There must be an awakening where widows will become specialists of raising people from the dead. Because they say widows receive their dead back to life. That was an announcement to our generation that the day will come when we will know this technology and we will master it. A day will come when all our advantages will become spiritual. That's why as you struggle to survive, you must begin to explore the spirit realm. Because not too many days from now, the things we speak about, they will begin to happen. Some of us here are elderly. And we know what is happening in this country. You already know that there is no hope in the Nigerian army. If you are informed, you know. Because when you recruit terrorists, and your idea of amnesty is to bring them into the army and give them legal reason for handling weapons, it means the future of that nation is sabotaged. Because that is not how amnesty is done. You don't empower a terrorist and call it an amnesty. You don't give a terrorist legal authority to carry out wickedness and you call it amnesty. It means very soon there will be no hope in the army. <laughs> Many people are not aware where we are. That's why you can go and sleep and sleep till morning and you say, I slept well. <laughs> if you are still sleeping well, it means you are not part of the people God is depending on. Matthew 24 verse 9. Hear what Jesus was saying. He said, okay, go to verse 8. You know, when we see awakening, people will think we are just coming to stir their atmosphere and then they pray in tongues. Hey, hey, no. That's for teenagers. When you go for teenagers' meeting, their priority is how loud they pray. We now, our focus is not how long we pray. Our focus is the things that we can access in prayer. So if it takes three days, we will wait there. We are no longer counting prayer by hours. We are counting prayers by spiritual mileage. How far we travel. Because it's the things we see and hear that we can deliver to our generation. He said, all these are the beginning of sorrow. He has talked about it. Now, if you read from verse 1, your heart will begin to fail you. When he reads verse 8, all the things he listed, he said, that's not the problem. Those ones are the beginning of sorrows. When you see nations rise against nations, you can still be praying somewhere and you'll be separated. When you see brothers killing brothers, he said, all of those things, they are the beginning of sorrow. That is not sorrow. So COVID is not sorrow. Hope you know millions of people died. Afghanistan fighting Iran. Israel fighting Iran. That's not sorrow. That's the beginning of sorrow. Now, if you study what is happening in the beginning of sorrow, you now think for a second if you were living in Afghanistan. You know what they do? They will wait. The way we are in church like this. They will just come and surround the church. And they will kill everybody. It's a normal ritual. And they, that's how they shut church down. They don't explode the church when you are not around. They wait for everybody to gather. Now when you gather, they will kill everybody before they explode the church. So the church is permanently shut down. Now if such a thing is happening, and it's called the beginning of sorrow, then you know that what is coming, you need more than doctrine to survive. When we talk about the great awakening, it's because if it doesn't happen, nobody will survive. Because the awakening is not just the sound of a trumpet. The awakening is to activate dimensions of God in men, so that men will walk in dimensions of immortality. You are not yet awakened until there is a dimension of God that you can handle. That's the 
idea. The awakening is not a prayer movement. Thank God for the prayer movement. It's a sign that we are beginning to be hungry. But the idea is not a prayer movement. Until awakenings begin to happen, and men begin to step into spiritual possibilities, step into spiritual dimension, there is no hope. Thank God for the people praying. We are all praying. But the prayer must take us somewhere. When you enter a dimension, that's when you are awoken. You are not awoken because now you are zealous for God. That was possible some years ago. You are awoken now when you become aware of a dimension. So suddenly, you go to pray and then you become aware of a dimension called immortality. And your body is caught and the body heals. You touch somebody, the person is healed. You say, what is happening? I didn't exercise my faith. That means you have entered the dimension. You have been awoken to that dimension. So the awakening is the summoning of men into spiritual possibilities. It's the summoning of men into immortal dimension. So some of us, when we are awoken, we will discover that we have become healing bound. And when somebody is shot, if we hold the person, he will be well. Even without praying. That's why Jesus said, lay hands on the sick, they will recover. He didn't say pray for the sick. That means Jesus was hoping that a generation will come that will be so awoken to divine life that when somebody is dying and they touch the person, life will return to the person. That's an awakened person. A point will come when you become awoken to El Shaddai. And then you will know that no, things are not supposed to finish with you. So like the children of Israel, your shoe will not grow old. When your leg is increasing, your shoe will be increasing with your leg. It's not a miracle. You have been awoken to El Shaddai. So your own things don't finish. It will remain new and replenished. So even your suit, you can wear one suit for 10 years. It will look as if you bought it yesterday. And then people are wondering how come. It's a realm. You have been awoken to that realm. Because angels don't need to change their dress. They are awoken to a realm. So every day they glow. They glow. They keep glowing. The awakening is the summoning of the body of Christ to supernatural realm. Because if we don't get awakened, we will still be living by luck and chance. The era of activities are over. We must step into the era of reality. When we come for a healing service, we don't need to be trusting that God will heal the sick. No. We know the dynamics of healing. Because we are open, we are aware. We are aware of that realm. So we know what to do for healing to take place. And every time we come to God, we are just giving thanks. We are giving thanks because we have become like gods on earth. He said, all these things, they are the beginning of sorrows. And then he went to verse 9. See what Jesus said. He said, you will be delivered up to be afflicted. You know what it means? The devil will not find you. The devil will corrupt people so much that it is from within you that those who you thought you could trust, they are the ones who sell you off. So when the church is trying to survive, they will go and tell them that if you do like this, do like this, you will destroy them. You will be delivered. You will not be caught. You will not be conquered. You will be delivered up. The same way Judas delivered Jesus. That's what will begin to happen. You will find biological family members. Somebody's son will go and say, Today, I believe in insurgency. And then the person will lead terrorists to his family. And say they don't want to follow the truth. And they will kill his family. And they will think he's serving God. That's the level of deception that is coming. A man will kill his own family and think he's doing a good work. And then you are wondering, when did you become like this? It is a sign of the last day that men will be delivered. Churches will be delivered. All kinds of betrayal. And then your brother will come and hug you. And you think he's hugging you. He's actually betraying you. The same way Judas came to Jesus and you say, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss. 
he delivered up Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying, in the last days, we, he's talking to believers now, when nations are fighting against nations, you can run and survive. But in the last day, they say you will be delivered. That means your attack will be specific to you. Your, your attack will know your location. All your vulnerabilities will be revealed to your attackers because you were delivered up for persecution. Your brother will go and lie against you. And they will open you to persecution to wreck your ministry. And you are wondering what happened. The reason is because you stood with him in the public and said, I love this man so much. This is my brother. Because you made the mistake to publicly validate this man. The next thing he will go out tomorrow and say, I know that man is a thief. He's a ritualist. There is something he does in the night. That's why he heals the sick. You will have no way of defending yourself. Because you have publicly come to say, I trust this man. I love this man. This man that I travel with, many times I tell people how that I trust him so much. That we have been friends for many years. If he stands up tomorrow now and say, this thing and this thing is a lie. There is no way I can defend myself. I will be persecuted because I was delivered up. He said those kinds of things will become common in the last day. The moment you collect your contract, you win a contract of 10 million or 100 million. You just tell your friend, I say, your prayer partner, that thank God, oh, this thing we have been praying for, God has finally answered. I've just been giving that contract of 100 million. The person will say, glory to God. He will speak in tongues for 10 minutes. When he finishes speaking in tongues, he will say, we thank God. He will now tell him, I just collected the money. Tomorrow I will go and put it in the bank. That night they will kill your whole family. Your prayer partner will sponsor your debt. You will be delivered up. So you need something more than trust. You need discernment in the spirit. You need something more than discernment. You need immortality. You need to be able to rule in certain realms. That even when those terrorists come and they say they are looking for Michael, you tell them, I am Michael. They will go back and fall down. And when they stand up, they will kneel down and repent. Because you carry something. That's the awakening. If dimensions of the spirit does not begin to visit the church, we will be in trouble. Because the wickedness that is coming, you can't understand it. Number two, Jesus said, you shall be killed. When Jesus was born, he was called salvation. How can salvation be talking to you? And salvation is telling you, you shall be killed. And he didn't add any clause to say, but I will come. In Revelation, he said, you will be delivered for ten days. You will be afflicted and you will be killed. That means in the last days, if you are truly a witness, then the possibility of death will not be far. Because the last days is the day of martyrdoms, of martyrs. That's why when he sent out his disciples, he said, go out and be martyrs unto me. The word witnesses is the word martyrs. Because he knows that if what you are doing is true witness, it's possible that you can be killed. So he told his own disciples, imagine if your pastor comes to church on Sunday morning and say, my little children, God has sent us to movie, but you will be killed. You will leave that church, you will not come back again. Because in the last days, we like churches where they stand and say, long life, prosperity, riches, that is beautiful. As much as you can, prophesy life, prophesy safety. As much as you can, prophesy wealth over your, 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 your brethren. But also, bring them to a place of conviction. That in the face of death, they will not deny Jesus. Because there is a possibility for that in the last day. He said, you shall be killed. That's Jesus talking to his own disciples. And he didn't stop there. He said, you shall be hated. Do you see why many will fall away? Because there are many Christians in the last day that cannot survive persecution. So when persecution starts, they will run. And they will run from persecution until they will lose their faith in God. If you now tell them, 
God saves, they will say, my brother, heaven helps those who help themselves. And the day may even come, they will tell them, you can't run anymore. The only thing you can do is that there is a herbalist that is giving people talisman against God and bullet shots. They will quickly go and collect it because they have escaped persecution until their faith have died. They have escaped death until their conviction have died. So when you tell them, we have to leave now, else we are finished, they will follow you anywhere. Even if they have to sleep in a shrine, they will go to a shrine and bow to another God to survive. The reason many will fall away is not because they want to. The reason many will fall away is because of persecution. It's because of death. Now, the Christianity that was handed over to us, they received this baptism. That's why they survived. Because when the early church started, some of them lived in caves. I read the story of the transition of the Bible that we read today. There was a man who had the last copy of the Bible. They hunted him like animal. He escaped until he crossed four cities. And then he looked for another faithful. Because then they used to call them faithfuls. If you look for faithfuls now, you may not find one. When he found that faithful and handed the Bible to the faithful. Now, that was the only copy of the Bible they had. When he handed it over, that was the same day he was caught. And when they caught him, they know it's a waste of time to punish a faithful. Because faithfuls will never change their conviction. So they don't waste their time punishing them. It's a waste. You know, if they catch you now, they can threaten you because they know you may change your mind. They will slap you. They will hit you something on your shoulder and break your bone. And some people, when they carry the iron to hit on their shoulder, they say, sorry, I, I, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. Those are the Christians today. But the early Christian, when they caught the man, they brought him out, sat him on a chair, and they lined up his family. Where is the copy of the Bible? The man said, he will not tell. They brought his first son out, shot him. They don't ask you twice, where is the copy of the Bible? He said, he will not tell. They brought his second son out, beheaded him. You don't know what the last day look like. It's not going to happen to you. But I'm telling you the era that we are living in. What your conviction can survive. Because when you go to heaven and you see men with crowns of life, they paid the price for it. In salvation, Jesus paid the price. But in eternal reward, we will pay the price. You may not be killed. Your family may not be killed. But can your conviction survive death? If death were brought on the table, can you still call Jesus Lord? Or you only call Jesus Lord because Jesus can bring you millions. Jesus can bring you breakthrough. Jesus can bring you deliverance. It means you are not part of those that God can rely on. Because this is not public sermon. This was Jesus talking to his own disciples. There were messages Jesus preached when there was a multitude. A message of multiplying bread. That's for the multitude. When there is multitude, Jesus healed the sick. But when he came to his own disciples, they are talking about matters of eternal inheritance. These are the kinds of things he taught his disciples. Can you survive death because of me? What can you withstand? Because you have come to the last day where Christianity must become a witness. And everyone that can be a true Christian must be baptized with the spirit of martyrdom. What can you withstand for Jesus? If you have not come to that point where your conviction is that strong, you need an awakening. Because it may not happen to you, but Jesus knows those who will not deny him. He knows them. That's why even before persecution came, he told Judas, that which you must do, do quickly. He knows the ones that have brought him there. So when we teach subjects like this, we are not saying calamity will befall men. But we are telling you that before you leave here, make sure you come to a point of conviction. And like Paul, you say, for me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. My walk with God has reached a point where I can give anything up for God, including my life. That is the Christianity of the last day. And until the body of Christ is awoken to that dimension, we don't have a witness to our generation. Because the reason we may still gather like this is because there is no gunshot. 
The reason we may still gather like this is because there is no famine. It's because there is no persecution. Because when persecution comes, our churches will go back to online churches. You know, when we started meeting online, gullible Christians began to say, we said it, all these geo, they will not get offering again. So they think the reason we gather together is for offering. They don't know the gathering together of the saints is where God commanded his blessings. They don't know that the gathering together of the saints is a gate where spiritual laws and legislation take place. But the reason why COVID and Ebola can make us disperse in the first place is because we don't have conviction. So men who should bring life to their generation are protecting themselves. They are so afraid that they will die. There's no conviction. I, I share sympathy with all those who suffer that death. But I'm telling you that the body of Christ must be awakened to a point where we are not threatened by sickness. We are not threatened by persecution. We are not threatened by death. We are excited people. So when we come to church, we want loud praise and worship. And we dance and sweat and we think we have done something. The same people dancing. If you hear one terror or threatening news, you will not see them in church again for one year. Because they are just excited people. God can't bank on them. When God is looking for men, He's not looking for the dancers. He's looking for the martyrs. Those who will go all the way for Him. Those who will endure. Those are the men God is looking for. When people are walking around you, they can call you rank a day day. It doesn't move you. You are looking for the man who cannot betray you. Even when he's offered the best thing of his life. He will value his relationship with you more than silver and gold. That's the kind of man you can work with. Jesus is not looking for a dancing church. Jesus is not looking for a singing church. Will the church dance? Yes. Will the church sing? Yes. But Jesus is looking for a church that have the power to witness. That's why when he sent us out, he didn't send us as singers. He didn't send us as preachers. He didn't send us as worshippers. He didn't send us as dancers. He sent us as what? Witnesses. Martyrs. And when you see the church that Jesus raised, all of them died. Not one denied Jesus. The churches we pastor today, all of them we run. You won't find anyone. But the church of Jesus, they stood their ground. I read church history. When Peter was to be crucified, he said, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be crucified upright like my master. He said, when you crucify me, turn it upside down. That's a disciple. A disciple is not a singer. A disciple is a man who has crossed the threshold of conviction. He will never turn back, no matter what happens. You know, when they came to Jesus first, they said, we have left everything to follow you. What do we have to gain? They were apprentices. When they became real disciples, the goal was not what do we gain. The soul, the goal now was what can we give for you? Father, even if it's my life, I can give it up. That's the church of the last day. And the reason we cry awakening is because a time will come when you can't preach. Listen to preachers from the U.S. now. They are motivational speakers. Because there are many things they can't say. If they say it, their ministerial license is threatened. So a preacher will come and talk to you like a trained psychologist. Because they can't say truth anymore. There are laws that when you say truth, it will forbid you from preaching. But I would rather be like John Wesley and preach one message that will set the nation on fire than to come to church every Sunday and talk psychology. Some of them can't even say Jesus is the way. They will tell you there are many ways. There are many ways. If you are kind, you will be saved. If you are, if you are loving, you will be saved. Some of them can't openly speak and say gay is not of God. Because if you say it, you may be arrested. There are many of them there that are doing a great job. But I tell you, a bulk majority of them have lost their conviction. What they are doing now is short business. They are psychologists. They recite their messages and they are careful. Every phrase and every sentence. Because they, they don't want to offend certain people. So we have come to a generation where we can't call sin, sin anymore. Because when you call sin, sin, they will say you are not tolerant. You are segregated. I'm not segregated. I'm preaching the word of life. If my, if my proclaiming my belief hurts another person, why would you want me to shut up because of another person? Am I not being hurt because of somebody else's belief? Why would everybody be given a chance 
but there are no men who can speak up. But I read of boys, three young Hebrew boys, and say, Oh, king, we will not be careful to answer you in this matter. If you like, make the fire seven times hotter. Make it seven times hotter. We will not bow. We will not bow. Those are the witnesses that Jesus is looking for. And there must be a cry for an awakening until the body of Christ get there. Until the body of Christ gets there, we will keep crying and remind us that we are babes and we are gullible. Even though we carry ties and good suits, even demons know that when the chiefs are down, only few can still call Jesus Lord. I read about a church in Egypt. They caught 50 people. That was in February. It's not story of antiquity. And 50 believers gave them an option of being restored, set free if they would change their mind concerning Jesus. They refused. They beheaded all of them. 13 of them were from one church. Not one said no. I asked myself, what is that pastor teaching? That is the person that should disciple me. Because whatever it is, he taught those people to be able to withstand the terror of beheading, of decapitation. I want to know that gospel. Because if you were arrested today and you had a choice, I assure you, the things you can endure are not many. Some of us can't even endure hunger. That's why when we want to fast, when it's three o'clock, we will start this fasting tomorrow. And we will eat. The next day, we make sure we eat around 12 midnight. Because we think the idea behind the fast is not to be hungry the next day. The hunger is one of the things you want to win. You are trying to beat your body to bring your body under subjection. So when you start the fast and you are very hungry, that's a good place to learn endurance. The idea is not to fast and not feel hungry. And you say, thank God, it's 12.30, I'm not yet hungry. Oh, thank you, Jesus. No. If you fast in six and you are not hungry, stretch it. That means it has not touched you. The devil said concerning Job, talking to God, he said, I also know men, skin for skin, a man will give anything for his body. Our church is a church of pleasure. Our church is a church of affluence. All we are interested in is what God gives. But we can't give anything back to God. So we are children. You give, you, you call your child, you buy a biscuit and give to your child. After giving your child a biscuit, you say, give me. He say, no. He puts it behind. That's the church of today. We are children. Lord, I love you. And the moment God gives you, even the prayer meeting, you can't come anymore. You say, Cat, I woke up with back pain. But when you were looking for a job, you could do 90 days VG. Now that job has come. Okay, today, um, greet pastor for me. Greet God's son. <laughs> and then once in a while, you send an alert from the money you now have. You think God is interested in the money. There must be an awakening. And the younger generation especially, we must refuse corruption. The corruption that comes with the deception and the pursuit of things. Will God bless us? Yes, in abundance. But we must come to a point where we are willing to even give up ourselves, if need be, for this God. That's how Christianity got to you. Christianity didn't come to you because there were many bogus rema. Or because the church was excited and dancing. The church that brought Christianity to you was a church that was alive in the spirit. And even in the face of death, they didn't back down. That's how Christianity got to you. They were not moved by number. Number is beautiful, but they were moved by witnesses. When they came to their congregation, they wanted to know how many witnesses are there. It's more important to have a church of 10 witnesses than to have a church of 10,000 people that have no witness. Now they have to motivate people and say, um, please, tomorrow we will fast from 6 to 12. Please don't forget, um, you can take tea and coffee. To fast from 6 to 12, you can take tea and coffee. As if you are 90 years old. You can take tea and coffee to fast from 6 to 12. 
and a young man of 25 cannot stay with Jesus till 3 p.m. When it's 12, he said, Pastor, say we can take water. So now when you talk about dry fast, there's a new definition of dry fast. Dry fast is fasting with only water. Wet fast is fasting with juice and wine. <laughs> they say, Daniel, eat no pleasant bread. <laughs> is it Daniel you are following or Jesus? Meanwhile, Daniel went for 21 days. When Jesus fasted, was he fasting with water? And then you say, you can withstand the devil. Hey, hey you demon. In the, are you not aware that you have commanded demons a thousand times? They didn't move. With all your good English language prayer, you think prayer is about English language. All the spirits in the air, the ones on land, the ones in water. In the name of Jesus, I gather all of you together and I cast you back to the abyss. When you finish speaking your English language, they will knock you again. Because their realm don't respond to English. They only hear spirit and life. How much life can you bring out of your spirit? And the way you can produce life is by death. Paul said we die daily. It is in dying that we bring out life. How much life can you generate? A man that carries life, if he stands here, even before talking, the Holy Ghost will start moving. He doesn't need a long sermon. The moment he comes, the anointing begins to move. Because he carries more than enough. He carries more than enough. God can flow through him any day, any time. There must be an awakening. The body of Christ is lukewarm. Man come to God. Only for what God has to give. And God is searching in the spirit. Where are my men? Paul showed up. He said, according as it is written, they believe and have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. I will not live on the testimony of Benson in the house. Thank God for what he did. But he's no more here. I am the one here now. I won't come for a miracle service and talk about Benson in the house. Because when I finish talking, Benson in the house will not come. I'm the one they are seeing. And whatever it is that he did, that he was able to challenge darkness in his time, I will pay the price to do the same. We are God evil Christians. We talk all the big stories, yet nothing is happening. And then people are excited. They hear stories. They jump up the screen. But nothing is changing. In the days of Benson in the house, he shut down witchcraft in the whole of Benin city. And for more than 20 years now, pastors are still quoting him. And iniquity is overrunning Benin city. We should cover our head with sackcloth and weep. We are asleep. You see, awake thou that sleepest. And Christ will give thee light. Jesus went further in that scripture and he said, Many will be betrayed. He said, Many will be offended. But because we don't know how things happen in the spirit, people lie against us and we go back in the flesh to fight them. Because we don't know spiritual transactions and economy, people rise up against us and we deploy fleshly energy to fight back. No. It is the spirit of the age manipulating them. When you see men lying and betraying, know that they have been enslaved by the spirit of the age. You don't fight them back in the flesh. You pray for them. Because the reason they are doing what they are doing is because they have become slaves of their generation. The reason a man will betray another man, a woman will betray another woman, a brother will betray a sister, is because of the spirit of the age. That's how it works. It enslaves men. And it teaches them the lifestyle of betrayal. And they cannot but betray. So when people betray you, know that you have seen those who are already overtaken by the spirit of the age. And when you see the volume of betrayers going on today, you will know that many are slaves. We need an awakening. We need an awakening. And finally, he said, because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. That 
that means a point will come when people will begin to struggle to pray. When you say music concert, you will need ten overflows. But when you say prayer meeting or vigil, you may need to stack half of the chairs in church. Because anything that has to do with spiritual energy, you will discover that many are weak. They can sit down, cross their legs, watch a movie for 10 hours, but tell them, let's pray for 20 minutes. You will discover how rusty many have become. The reason is because of iniquity. Because we are in a generation where when you open Facebook, you will be welcomed by a naked woman. When you open even my writing pad, my writing pad, where I take note, this is not a chat site. This is a writing pad on my phone. I finish writing. I want to close my writing pad. An advert pops up and you see a naked person. And then you say, what is going on? Is the spirit of the age. So they want to sell razor blade. They use a man bare chested with pant. How does pant advertise razor blade? It's to weaken you. I was speaking about the reality show called Big Brother Niger the other time. I'm not against reality TV. There are many noble reality TVs where they task human intellect, they task human endurance. They hunt things, they search things, you see endurance, they leave them signs where they, they think creatively and tactically. They explore their energy to find out the win task, you know, and they win the, the profit. I'm not against reality show. But when you begin to legalize pornography, then there's a problem. And then you find gullible Christians for three months. Big Brother Niger is playing non-stop. And then they come. They are saying, how can a married woman sleep with somebody? That means we have deteriorated to a level where it wouldn't have been a problem if she was not a married woman. I looked, they were complaining that that lady, she's married. She came and slept with somebody. So if she were not married, it wouldn't have been a problem. To let you know the level of decadence. Once upon a time, in this same society, when you are dressed carelessly, people abhor you. Now, people can kiss on reality show. It's normal. Single people can have open intimacy on reality TV. It's normal. It's only married people we are offended with. And because that threshold should have been crossed, the next edition is two. Two married women that will sleep and it will no longer be a problem. You don't know that we are graduating in iniquity. And then the younger and innocent generation who don't know what is going on. Nine years old, eight years old, seven years old, they cross their leg and they are watching. What up? And then we mentor them and train them in the path of iniquity. And you think such men can have spiritual stamina. That's why we are good movie watchers. We are good football analysts. We are good club dancers. But when we come to ascend in the spirit, many can't even ascend above the ceiling of the building where they are in. When you say, let's pray. Shabbat, shabbat, shabbat. Shabbat, shabbat, shabbat. They now sit down, put their hand on their face. And they are doing like this. You think they are in the spirit. When you come close, you discover the person is snoring in prayer meeting. Because the love of many will what? Wax cold. Because iniquity will abound. Iniquity will abound. I went for a pastor's meeting. And because we had so much to discuss, we said, okay, let's just charge our spirit for four hours. I didn't say, I said, pastor's meeting. Meanwhile, at this level now, we are not supposed to be praying with time. The only reason we should pause is because somebody has picked something and is bringing us a message from heaven. Because at this time, our prayer should be gauged by the realities with traffic because we expect that many can ascend. We came for pastor's meeting. After 30 minutes, people were snoring everywhere. The senior pastor was so troubled, he had to tell some pastors to stand on their, on their chair. 
in a prayer meeting. They had to tell pastor because we, wake up oh, after 20 minutes ago. That's somebody that is a shepherd over a congregation. They had to tell them stand on your plastic chair and a pastor is standing because he has not mastered sleep. I'm not talking about sin. Sleep. A man of God has not conquered sleep. So much so that even in a prayer meeting, sleep is ruling over him. He said, the love of many will wax old. Meanwhile, there are many people that preaching is a distraction. They are looking for time because they want to seek God. They say there are great and mighty things that they want to search for in the spirit. John said, I, John, I was in the aisle called Patmos. And I heard a voice as of a trumpet. And what did the voice tell him? Revelation 4 verse 1. He said, come up here. I will show you things that will happen hereafter. There are many men that are already experiencing the things that will happen in the world to come. We, we have not even been able to conquer this present world. This present evil world have mastered some of us. Whereas, there are some men that are walking out of this world to see the things in the world to come. And we say we are all apostles. If you call yourself an apostle where John is, they will punish you. Because you don't know the meaning of, of an apostle. An apostle is a sent man. He's the one who carries the burden of the kingdom as a message. Because he has seen the one that dwells in the spirit. So he communicates his oracles. He's not a Bible school teacher. He's a witness to his generation. And the only way you can witness to your generation is when you can see the things hereafter. These men love God so much that even in pain, they were not distracted. He said, I, Ezekiel, in the 30th year, and on the 4th month, and on the 5th day, I was among the captives by the river Kaba. And I saw visions of God. The man was not praying, Lord, save us, save us. There are certain men that when they are arrested, they are looking for how to convert the terrorists. It's an opportunity to preach to them about Jesus. But we, we are begging, help me. No. May God baptize many of us with the spirit of martyrdom. Our conviction will convert terrorists. You know, when that guy pierced Jesus, and Jesus did not break, even in death, he said, truly, this is the Son of God. There is a level of dogged conviction that you will manifest that your captors will become your disciples. They took you to kill you, but you will walk out of the forest with them as disciples because you showed them something that the God they believe in could not show them. When they think they will break you, you become stronger. And then they will know that what powers you is not from this realm. Because iniquity will abound. The love of many will wax cold. So people come to worship God in church. They think it's fashion. They think it's time for a show. Somebody is worshipping God. He wants to kill himself. As if she is doing beauty pageantry. She doesn't know that she is on holy ground. She needs to be sensitive to find out the movements of the spirit. Her first assignment or his first assignment is to align with that motion. Because until he finds that motion, he can't bless the people. But iniquity will abound. So a pastor will spend the whole night ironing his suit and his tie. Even the few hours he has in the morning, he will need to polish his shoe. And then when he's coming to church, he's strolling. He's more conscious of time. And then even when he's preaching, he's conscious of how he's standing. Because he's an educated man. He's an elite. He won't move. He is coordinated. Is coordinated. <laughs> Meanwhile, nothing is being piped down from heaven, but it doesn't matter. He can stop the move of the spirit if the camera setting is not sharp. He can stop the move of the spirit if the light, the color combination is not good. Because he's more conscious about the background than the move of the spirit. Is anything wrong with excellence? No. But we know value and we know spiritual cadres. And Jesus told us in verse 13, Matthew 24, He said, They that endure to the end. He didn't say, They that escape.
You know, when you say great awakening, I need to show you the things that will befall us. And I need to tell you the place that we will possibly go to. When you come to a doctor, there is diagnosis, there is prognosis, and then there is treatment. Diagnosis is to tell you the cause of the problem. Prognosis is to tell you the possible outcome. Then treatment can take place. The awakening is not just a shout. We need to show us where we are and the things that is possible to be before the church. And those of you in the north don't need many stories. You're already working in it. But it's not enough to hope that God will come because there are many times when God may not come. Because they that endure, they will be saved. So while you are enduring, there are weapons you need. Because endurance doesn't mean, kill me, I will be here. Sometimes endurance means you learn how to bilocate. So when the enemy comes, they have surrounded the church. All of a sudden, pastor say, everybody, bow your heads. He wants to activate a dimension. And when everybody bow their heads, they become invincible. Shoot for money till night, you won't find anybody there. When they finish and they go, we will, go, we will be in our home. We have actually endured. Because enduring must not be dead. Enduring sometimes can be tapping into divine frequencies. But for us to walk that level of power, there are things in the spirit that we must access. If I ask you today, what is your greatest possession? What will you mention? You have been a Christian for 10 years and you have attended many programs. But what is your greatest asset? If your greatest asset is seeing money, it means you have no difference with the secular man. If your greatest asset today is a man, it means you are in trouble. Because when we are awakened, our greatest asset will no longer be natural things. Some of us, our greatest asset will become prayer. So when things go wrong, just give us five minutes. When we begin to pray, we can change the paradigm. We have found a wealth that cannot be bought. If you like, surround our house. You read the story of Elisha. When the enemy came in a many chariots, Gehazi was afraid. Because Gehazi's assets were natural. But Elisha looked at him and said, no, we are not in trouble. They are the ones in trouble. You can't talk like that if your asset is in the bank. You can only talk like that if your asset is in the spirit. That an army comes against you and you look left and right, you are only two. Elijah, Elijah had sight. So he knew what was happening in the spirit that Gehazi didn't know. And when Gehazi wanted to trouble him, he said, Lord, give him the wealth that I have in the spirit. Open his eyes. And when his eyes opened, he saw round about them that there were chariots of fire. In the last days, your assets cannot be only natural. Yes, we have natural assets, but you must have at least one spiritual asset. Either you have the eyes that see, or the ears that hear, or the mouth that prays, or the heart that understands. By all means, one of these four gates must open a spiritual dimension to you. If not, you will not endure to the end. The only way you can endure to the end is when you tap into spiritual advantage. Some of us, by hearing, we can become invincible. Some of us, by praying, we can outrun the chariots of Ahab. Some of us, by seeing, we can tap into bounties of the spirit that will make scarcity not to exist in our realm. But by all means, you must have an asset. Do you have the mouth that pray? And if you have the mouth that pray, what can that prayer bring to you? Because the goal is not just prayer. The goal is to command dimensions in the spirit. Do you have eyes that see? And if your eyes see, how deep and how far can you see? What can you command because of your sight? Because if you see him, you will be like him. Do you have ears that hear? If you have ears that hear, what can come to your realm because of the things you have downloaded through sound? Do you have hearts that understand? If you have a heart that understands, 
where can it take you? These are the assets of the last day. Because if we don't have it, then we are in trouble. And in order not to be in trouble, there is a need for an awakening. That the man that sleep, we arise. He say, awake, thou that sleepeth, and Christ will give thee rest. There is a rest that is available, but you must be awakened in the spirit. Your life must not be a function of luck and chance. You must not exist at the mercy of your enemy. It shouldn't be said that we are here today because Boko Haram is not interested in this place. No. It should be said that we are here today because by the strength of the spirit, we have pushed back the armies of the alien. The Bible said, Samuel erected an altar before the Lord. And he called that altar Ebenezer. And he said, so long as Samuel lived, the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. So the reason the Philistines did not attack Israel in the day of Samuel is not because it was not captured in their military intelligence. It's because Samuel stopped them by prayer. The assets we have by prayer is not how long we can pray. It's the things we can command through prayer. And if our generation pray, a day has come where men of prayer, who truly are men of prayer, can shift and put to flight the armies of the alien. And we know that if Nathaniel and Samuel and Philip are in the prayer meeting, then we are safe. Because when they pray, even lightning can fall from heaven. When they pray, the place is shaking. And the devil will feel the tremor of their prayer in the spirit. He will not come close. A day will come when we know that so long as Pastor Stephen Kobe is around, we will know when the enemy is coming. Because there is a sight that will tell us that the enemy is way off. Take, 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 take safety. Take defense. Because somebody can see in the spirit. A day has come when we will know that there are those who hear in our midst. So when there is evil, they will tell us the direction that we should go. Like the sons of Isaac. They will have understanding of times and of seasons. And they will know what Israel ought to do because they can hear. And that day has come where men of understanding heart must rise among us and show us the counsel of God. There's a need for an awakening. The body of Christ is asleep. We don't have warriors anymore. We don't have strong men anymore. In the days of David, it wasn't a factor how many the enemies are. There were prophets like Samuel. There were prophets like Nathan. There were prophets like God. They could consult with the Urim and the Tumim. And they would tell David where the enemy is, how to fight. And because of their prophetic powers, David became invincible. And the Bible said, David said, the Lord taught my hands to fight and my fingers to war. David said, by my God, I ran through a troop. I leaped over a wall. David became an invincible immortal in his generation because he had eyes that see. If our churches today no longer have eyes that see, we will live in pain and in darkness. Let it not be said that we were taken on our words. There must be an awakening. There must be an awakening. There must be an awakening. Men who see must rise. Men who hear must rise. God was speaking in Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 1. He said, even if Moses and Samuel pray on this matter, I will not answer. Do you know why? That means there were, there were men that existed in this world that when they pray, even if God did not have it in his program, God will have to include it. Because none of their words can fall to the ground. The men in the order of Moses and Samuel must rise again. So that even if the enemy have encompassed our habitation, this man can pray to heaven and the hand of God can come against them. Because when they pray, God cannot deny them. They have done business on the altar to a point where the heavens know their voice. And when such men pray, their works are law in the spirit. When those awakening come, men will become like gods. When we come to church, we will walk according to our ranks. We will be known according to the dimensions that we represent. 
and the church of Christ will become invincible again. That's why he said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm upon his holy mountains. That the inhabitations of the land, the habitation of the land may tremble because the day of the Lord cometh. He says it's a day of darkness. But the problem is not the darkness and the gloominess because when the darkness move, he said, an army will rise. And he said, they have never seen that kind of army. Neither will they see such. Even after the years of many generations, he said, behind that army is a desolate wilderness. That means everything they pass over, they crumble it. There's no force that can withstand them. And he said, before them is the garden of the Lord. That means they define what happens to them. He said, even if they fall upon the sword, they shall not be injured. That's an invincible army. Shoot them, they will not be injured. Stab them, they will not be injured. They have entered into their immortal shape. If that church doesn't rise again, then we will be victims. We have assets in the spirit that we must wake up to receive. There are dimensions of God that is awaiting us. The day where the glory of the church is number have passed. Where we snap pictures to show the crowd that attend our church or the size of our auditorium. That day is past. Because we have come to know now that the hope of a territory is not the size of the auditorium or the number of people that go to church. Because Paul said, Epaphras is one out of all of you. But that one Epaphras, he said he labors fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So one man was more important than the whole congregation. So even though we value number, because it's a testimony that God is increasing, or the people of God are increasing, we are more conscious about stature. So when we gather and we are ten, what can ten of us do? I was coming to this territory, the roads were so desolate. At about 7 p.m., everywhere was already dry. And I saw a road that was bad for one hour plus. We were driving. The road was, there were no quotas. They peeled it off and it was completely galloping. And they said, the governor, before the last one, came from Mubi. That the, the current governor is from this axis. And I'll say, where are the men who can command these men in the spirit and they will do what they ought to do? Where are the men that can walk to the king and tell him, I have a word for you from the Lord. And if the king stretch his hand to afflict them, that hand will be paralyzed because of the power they came with. Where are such prophets? What has happened to the church? There is need for an awakening. So that when we gather, five of us is enough for a city. The early church had so much stature that number was a body for them. The Bible says, Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there. The whole city was full of joy. The whole city. One man had the weight and the stature to conquer a city. Today we have many apostles Many prophets, but the territory is in darkness. There must be an awakening. So that we realize that Christianity is not a religion. It's divinity expressed through humanity. We will realize that we are not here to take from God only. We are God's battle axe. We are his weapon of war. And when God wants to affect the territory... He begins to look for men. And he will say, even if everybody is not, a, is not ready, if God needs one man in movie, let me be that one man. If it is one man God is looking for in movie, let it be that one man. It's not just about the church I attend. It's about who I have become in the spirit. Lord, if it's one woman you are looking for in movie, let me be that woman. I will pay the price. Because I've come to know that the hope of my generation is not on the government, it's on the church. When you enter the church, where are the men? Where are the women? There must be an awakening. We are so many that you cannot count us. But the things that one man did 
in the first church, a thousand men cannot do in our own generation. In the first church, one man can take a city. In our generation, a thousand churches cannot take a city. Something is wrong. What one man did in the early church, a thousand churches cannot do in the latter day church. We need an awakening. You want to bow your heads and talk to the Lord? I wanted to talk about the kingdom because in Matthew 24 verse 14, he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all the worlds. I came this morning to talk about the gospel of the kingdom, but can you even receive it? Can we receive it? If you are ready, I want to pray for a few persons this morning. You are dissatisfied with the status quo. You know, see the way I'm calm. Because it's a body. It's not supposed to excite you. It's those that should hear it that will hear it. Those who are not part of what God wants to do now. It's not a, it will not be a burden to them. They can even sleep. So they should go ahead and sleep well. Those God is talking to is talking to in coded language. Just in case you are ready. You may be a pregnant woman. You may be a young boy. You may be a young girl. You may not even be educated. The credentials are not earthly. The credentials are spiritual. All God is looking for is a winning heart. You are ready. Just in case. Place your hand on your chest. You are the one I came for. Please help the brother. So we'll sustain the battle. You can sit down. Don't be distracted. Some of you are already distracted because you are not ready. You are looking for things to happen. What is, what is going on now is beyond things happening. God is looking for an army. People of capacity that can endure to the end. In the evening we will have a miracle service. Many people will be healed. Because God will continually heal people. But there are those who are growing that will never need healing again. So long as they are in this world, they have entered divine health. God will bless many people with finances. But there are those who have grown. They now have the power to get wealth. The Holy Ghost is beginning to touch people. All shall serve those that God is touching now. The awakening has already begun. Bring them to the front. The power of the Holy Ghost is already upon them. I told you it's a recruitment. It may not be service as usual. The waters of the Spirit are being stirred. Help that sister so she doesn't injure herself. Those who are distracted, well done. Continue. Help those that the power of God is coming upon. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm upon his holy mountain. If you were blessed by the message you just listened to and wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. If you just say this prayer, please send us an email on amodiscipleship at gmail